And thank you, Shane. Uh, good evening, and uh, we're live from the News First newsroom here in Dawson Street. And uh, I'm joined by Zulfik Farzan, who's been diligently following the proceedings at the Presidential Commission of Inquiry into the issuance of bonds by the Central Bank. Uh, good evening, Zulfik. Good evening, Farzan. Today was um, a rather spectacular and a very special day. We had two very powerful ministers uh, who were summoned to the Presidential Commission of Inquiry by the commissioners, who were led, of course, by uh, Justice uh, K.T. Chichisiri. What was the significance of the arrival of these two uh, very senior ministers and also um, senior members of the United National Party? Well, for us, the ministers in question, Malik Samarawikuma and Khabib Hashim, were summoned before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry because evidence was led by previous witnesses that they were among those present at a breakfast meeting that had taken place on the 26th of February 2015, which is one day before the controversial bond auction took place uh, at the Central Bank. Now, at this meeting, at the, sorry, when the evidence was led between these two uh, ministers, Malik Samarawikuma at that time was not a minister. He had taken part in this meeting as a senior advisor to the Prime Minister. Khabib Hashim, who is also the General Secretary of the United National Party, attended as the Minister of Highways and Investment Promotion. And, and uh, Zufik, what, what, what did they, do we know what was exactly discussed at this meeting? Well, for us, first of all, they confirmed there was a breakfast meeting, and then they also confirmed that among those present with them was the former Minister of Finance, Avi Kavanaika, personnel from the Central Bank, personnel from the Treasury, and personnel from the Road Development Authority. Now, they said this meeting was centered around a requirement that the Ministry of Highways has uncovered as unsettled bills uh, for road construction work that had commenced during the Mahindra Rajapaksa administration, right. and that sum was 18 billion rupees. And Kabir Hashim, the minister, had said the ministry has 3 billion rupees and they had written to the treasury requesting for the additional 15 billion immediately so they can settle these bills and following discussions only this breakfast meeting had transpired. I see. And um, uh, so we had 15 billion and we had 18 billion and uh, but the prime minister speaking to parliament uh, on the 17th of March 2015 when he made a special statement on the matter of the bonds um, said there was only a requirement of 15 billion rupees. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear what the prime minister had to say at the time. Adala Pasovia Pilibando Karuma Idripat Karana Mahinda Rajapaksa Palna Samedi Mahamar Gamatia and Sevising Isidu. Let me begin with the background of events. The Ministry of Highways of the Mahinda Rajapaksa administration made commitments and signed contracts totaling over 100 billion rupees without any monetary allocation. Funds were needed urgently to meet these payments. This was the issue. We had to make payments for work that was done, work that is ongoing, and work that we have entered agreements into. We decided to pay for the work already done at a later date and make payments for ongoing work and what are due to commence. We cannot collect 100 billion rupees at once. During a meeting on the 26th of February attended by the Minister of Finance, Minister of Highways, Secretary to the Ministry of Finance, the Governor of the Central Bank and the Deputy Governor, it was decided that 15 billion rupees would be required urgently. By then the Central Bank had already advertised the issue of 1 billion rupees in Treasury bonds. Even if it has rupee billion, a cup, banda garaka, bandum, karanikut kirima, and name Mahabanko, then we impalakara tibuna. And that's what the Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Rani Vikramasinghe, had to say in Parliament on the 17th of March 2015. Now then, Zofik, was there any discussion at this breakfast meeting about an auction or the methodology of uh, raising these, the requirement of 15 billion? Well, for us, when these two ministers were questioned today by the commissioners themselves, they said there was no such discussion about the Treasury bond auction on the 27th of February or any discussion about the issuance of Treasury bonds. I see. And, and it's, it's very clear from uh, the Prime Minister's statement in Parliament uh, that it was 15 billion that was the requirement. So why, uh, Zofik, is there this sudden requirement of 75 billion rupees? Where does this requirement manifest itself from? Well, for us, it all transpired when Arjuna Mahendran's council earlier this year produced a brand new undated letter to the Commission, which he claimed 
was proof that this breakfast meeting had taken place and the requirement that was decided was 75 billion rupees. Now this undated letter, according to Mr. Arjuna Mahendra, the former governor of the central bank, he obtained it in June 2016 in order to produce it to COPE from uh, then finance minister Ravi Kaunarnaika. He wanted to show to COPE that there was a meeting and there was a discussion and a decision to raise 75 billion rupees in one month. Now when Ravi Kaunarnaika was summoned before the Presidential Commission of Inquiry, he was questioned on this letter as well. At that point, Ravi Kaunarnaika said that he issued this letter upon the request of Arjuna Mahendran so that he can produce it to COPE. Ravi Kaunarnaika also said that there was a meeting on the 26th of February 2015 which he also attended and there was a discussion and decision on 75 billion rupees. But that's, that's sort of uh, contradicted by, uh, by the others at the meeting, including Mr. Malik Samarik and Mr. Kabir Hashim, that the, the, they, they say that there was a requirement only 15 billion. Uh, so uh, it appears that Mr. Karanaka and Mr. Mahendran are talking about 75 billion. Could they be talking of some other meeting? Well, we don't know what meeting they're talking about. But these ministers were questioned about the breakfast meeting that took place on the 26th of February uh, 2015. But interestingly, there was a witness by the name of S.R. Artigal. He's the Deputy Secretary to the Treasury. He said something interesting. He said that there was no additional cash requirement for February 2015. We can have a look at the report that we filed on the 17th of July 2017 when S.R. Artigal was giving evidence. The Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, S.R. Artigala, submitted his evidence via an affidavit. He said the Secretary or the Minister of Finance did not inform the Treasury of any urgent government cash requirement for the month of February 2015. The requirement of Rs 75 billion, as mentioned in a letter bearing the signature of then Finance Minister Ravi Karunanayake, was not indicated to the Treasury. It must be noted that this letter, produced earlier by Arjuna Mahendran's lawyers, was challenged by the state for not indicating a date or to whom it is addressed. Articular said if there is an urgent cash requirement, that would be indicated in the respective monthly cash flow requirement. The witness stated that urgent requirements of smaller amounts would be addressed using the OD facility with the Bank of Ceylon or People's Bank or via the issue of treasury bills. He went on to say that the requirement of such a magnitude would have to be raised via treasury bonds or Sri Lanka development bonds. In the event of an urgent need of rupees 75 billion, the Ministry of Finance must make an official request from the Treasury, and thereafter the Treasury would communicate it to the Central Bank. Thereafter, the cash flow requirement for the corresponding month will be revised and sent to the Public Debt Department. Article testified that a minister never directly tells a governor of a cash flow requirement. For February 2015, the debt service or the amount of money required to make payments was 33.64 billion rupees. The public debt department had borrowed a total of 60.91 billion rupees, of which 28.38 billion rupees was used to retire treasury bills. It came to light that the balance for the month of February was 8.28 billion rupees. The witness said, therefore, there was no shortfall in the cash flow requirement. Now, uh, now then, Zufik, um, the that letter, this undated, unreferenced letter, which talks of 75 billion as opposed to 15 billion, they said that this was um, this appeared rather crisp. It seemed yes. noticeable for its crispiness. How was that achieved? Well, Mr. Ajda Mahendran was questioned about that when he was giving evidence, and the answer to that was when he obtained it from Ravi Kaunanaika in June 2016, he knew that this was a very important document, so he kept it inside his safe under an air-conditioned environment. That was his answer to the crisp nature of that undated document. This was a, this was a letter uh, that is to do with affairs of state, but it was in his private safe. Yes. In an air-conditioned environment. Exactly. Well, I say. Uh, now then, there's another thing that happened today, and a very important question was uh, posed uh, to the uh, to these two ministers by the commissioners, and that was, and what was it? That question. Well, for us, the same question to both the ministers was: during the tenure 
of this whole issue. Did Perpetual Treasury is limited? Any company of the Perpetual Group, a company of Sri Lanka Group, Arjun Aloysius, Jeffrey Aloysius, or any of their family members give any monetary funding or payment to the United National Party? Malik Samarabikuma and Kabir Rashim both said that those companies and individuals did not make any monetary fund or a payment to the United National so Party. So no donations were made by any of these people to the United National Party? According to these two ministers, the chairman and the general secretary, no donations had been made to the UNP. And uh, one more uh, matter before we hand it all uh, back to uh, downstairs. What about Steve Samuel and uh, the to-do files? What's that? all about. Interesting question for us. Steve Samuel, the personal assistant to Arjun Aloysius, was summoned to appear before the commission at 11 this morning. However, his lawyer said that he was rushed to hospital this morning following a, a chest pain, according to what his lawyers had to say. Now, in addition, notices had been issued on Arjun Aloysius and Jeffrey Aloysius to submit these so-called to-do files that had reference to uh, Steve Samuel's mobile phone as well and the main reason is these files have reference to RK and AM so the commissioners want to know who are the subjects of RK and AM and uh, are, they, are these soft files or are they hard files what are they do we know we don't know whether they are soft files or hard files but there is clearly a reference in Steve Samuel's mobile phone that these files do exist Zufik Fazan, th thank you very much uh, for that uh, excellent work. Thank you. And um, uh, we're going to hand you over back to Arundhati. And thank you very much. Thank you, Faraz, for that comprehensive analysis. Taking a look at another one of our headline-making stories, Shalil Amuna Singha, who was removed from his position of executive chairman of Litrogas earlier today, and Janaka Namuni, who were arrested in connection to 2.1 million US dollars being stolen from the Far Eastern International Bank in Taiwan, were remanded till the 25th of this month. The two suspects were produced before Fort Magistrate Lanka Jayaratna. The CID informed that charges have been filed against them through the Money Laundering Act and the Computer Crime Act. The incident came to light after the Taiwanese Criminal Investigations Bureau commenced an investigation into an incident where the computers in the Far Eastern International Bank were hacked into and money was transferred into accounts in several other countries including Sri Lanka. The owner of the account in the Taiwanese bank that was hacked into was present at the courtroom today when the case was taken up. A team from Interpol and a group of officials from the FEIB are to arrive in the country today. It was revealed in court today that a sum of 2.1 million US dollars was transferred into the account of the first suspect in the case, J.C. Namuni, through the Bank of Ceylon in New York, USA. The money had been withdrawn twice and the initial withdrawal had been 30 million rupees. In addition to these two suspects, investigations have revealed that there are two Indian nationals who are involved in the incident. The CID informed that investigations have begun into the other suspects as per the evidence provided by the two initial suspects. Janaka Namuni, the first suspect in the case, is a dual citizenship holder of England and Sri Lanka. The former chairman of Litro Gas, Munasingha, who is the second suspect in the case, is a British citizen, according to the CID. The CID informed court that his visa will expire on the 28th of December. The CID further said Munasingha possessed a Sri Lankan NIC and a bank account in Sri Lanka. The 30 million rupees that was initially withdrawn had been divided among several people at a hotel in Colombo 2 and at the office building of Shalila Munasingha. The two Indian nationals had been present at both these instances and they had left the country with 15 million rupees. The court granted permission to the CID to investigate the electronic devices that were allegedly used for the hacking. The court also granted permission to the CID officers to record statements of the suspects when required with the permission of the prison officials.